Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be sober. I'm grateful to be here. I want to thank you, Candace, for that moment. I was thinking about the moment of my the uh, proudest time or happiest time, or I, you, you'd said something, and, and I was sit, sitting there thinking. And I, I remember on uh, November 29, 2006, I, I was in the lab, uh, in labor. Well, I wasn't in labor; my girlfriend at the time was, and uh, but she was giving birth to my son. And um, you know, my mom used to always talk about you guys. Used to always hear her share about how she always needed a job here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she was taught to have a job. So. Her job at, at, at the birth of my son was uh, she was the photographer, <laughs> you know, which is weird altogether. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and and, uh, and it's weird for me. And it's, you know, it's just like, oh, this is gnarly. You know what I mean? And my sponsor's like, just, you know, just ask her, you know, your girlfriend where she wants you to be. And she's like, you stand here and don't move. So I'm just standing there like this. And my mom's like all up in there, you know, at the camera. <laughs> and I'm like, this is awkward. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, um, you know, and, uh, and so I'm sitting there thinking about that. And I thought about when I cut the umbilical cord, I remember looking at my mom and my mom was so proud. She was so proud of Alcoholics Anonymous for what you guys gave me. You gave me the ability to show up. You gave me the ability to face my fears. You gave me the ability to be a good son, to be a good boyfriend, to be a good friend. I want to thank Ralph for asking me to do this. You know, I, I my sponsor is Jonathan Clark. He lives in Idaho. He's just a normal dude, you know. And you start to do this a lot, and you know, and, and guys that sponsor you, that, that talk seem to be under the Carl Morris line or the Bill Cleveland line. I just got a goofy guy from Idaho. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just got a goofy guy from Idaho. You know, Luther Wood took him through the steps. Clint Hodges took Luther Wood through the steps, and Don Pritz took Clint Hodges through the steps. And my life has been profoundly changed. And um, and I and I want to thank you, Ralph, because. Um, you know, Ralph called me. He's never heard my talk, which, you know, I'm sorry, you know. And uh, <laughs> But he said, hey, you know, your mom passed away. And, like, I just, I'm praying and I'm meditating. And I truly believe you're the one. Like, you've come to do this. And I was taught early on that whatever I'm asked to do something in Alcoholics Anonymous, just to say yes, because that's where God wants me to be. And I just keep saying yes, and I keep showing up. And I know that God has a reason for me here other than just being, you know, carrying on the legacy of my mom, you know. I truly believe that to the core of my soul. I woke up at 5.40 this morning and got straight into prayer and straight into meditation, really getting close to this source and this power. And I ask this power that you use me today to speak right through me. And I don't know what's going to come, but here it goes, you know. Hilda gave a great talk last night, and I laughed, and I needed that laughter. You know what I mean? And then Tara came in with that educational, like, just bam. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm sitting there going, I'm dumb as nails over here. You know what I mean? You know? Uh, you know what I mean? I'm like, man, I, I wish I were taking notes. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, because I'm an experience kind of guy. I need, I need, I need something. I need, I'm an experiential, you know, whatever that experiential, whatever. Is that the right word? You know what I mean? I'm like that kind of guy. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, I need some experience, bro, because I'm dying. I've sat in the rooms of alcoholics and I'm just dying of untreated alcoholism, being educated, but without getting that experience. And I'm sitting there and I'm dying. And I go to the noon meeting and the lady's like, well, you're right where you're supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah, if you knew, lady, I'm going home and wanting to kill myself, you know what I mean? I don't know if this is where I'm supposed to be, you know? And so I come here today to share my experience, my strength, and my hope with step two. I'm not a, you know, come-to-believe kind of guy. You know, I'm a real smart guy, you know what I mean? Which is always interesting. You're, you're going to come talk on come-to-believe, you know what I mean? I'm like, most days I don't believe in God at all. It's taboo to say around here, you know what I mean? 
have that conversation with someone. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sure I'll get pegged in the back. You know, you got to come to believe. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, I want to thank my girlfriend for surprising me. Thank you. And um, my, my sobriety date's October 23rd, 2002. I have a sponsor. He knows he's my sponsor. I called him this morning. He didn't answer my phone, but I left all my insecurities and my fears for about five minutes on his voicemail. <laughs> I mean, the voicemail shut off at three, but I kept going. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I, you know, he knows all the three minutes of the five at least, you know. And uh, he'll call me later and I'll get current again with the same five minutes. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm self-centered or anything, you know. I will try to ask how his day's going first, though, you know. And... Uh, and I have a sponsor. I told you I have a sobriety date, and I have a home group. My home group's the South Coast Speakers Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet on a Wednesday night in Laguna Beach. And I am forever grateful for my home group. And I remember walking up to my home group. You know, I was 31 days out of, out of the Sally, you know, the Salvation Army, and uh, they finally let me off restriction. You know what I mean? And um, and I and uh, my sponsor was like, "You're going to AA," and I was like, "Yes, out of the Sally," you know, and. Uh, and I went to the and I went walked up to my home group and I and I walked up to the door and I was met by a man by the name of John Ackerlin. And he had this thick accent and he put his hand out to me and he said, Welcome, kid. And he grabbed my hand, he said, Come in with me. And he brought me into the middle of my home group. He brought me right into the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. He sat me down in, amongst giants. Amongst giants, guys with forty years, forty five years, forty eight years, Tommy Whalen. Johnny Crean, just uh, Frank O'Rourke, just guys, giants. And I sat there, and I was just vibrating, you know what I mean? And he put his hand on my leg. He's like, don't forget to breathe, kid. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you know. and, and I would want to get up to go to the bathroom, and he'd say, we don't go to the bathroom during the meeting, kid. We do that before, and we do that after. And um, he told me to thank the speaker. I didn't like him. I was like, I don't know why I got to thank him. <laughs> He said, we don't care if you like him. He drove from L.A. Thank him anyways. You know what I mean? And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> you know, and uh, someone asked me to, to participate in the meeting, to read the 12 traditions. He's like, he's not participating. He's not wearing a collared shirt, you know. And I was mad because I didn't get a read. I didn't want it, but I was still mad. And uh, <laughs> But I'll tell you what happened. My character defect of wanting you to like me, I wore a, I wore a dress shirt the next week, you know, just because I wanted John to like me, you know. I'm a firm believer my character defects kept me around here for a long time. God used them in order for me to help another alcoholic, you know, in order for me to stay sober long enough. And and so next week I, I, I wore the collared shirt and they didn't ask me to read and I was pissed, you know. And, <laughs> but I'm an active member of my home group I'm, and I'm grateful for those old timers. He spoon fed me Alcoholics Namas. He taught me how to show up to Alcoholics Namas one day at a time. He gave me that unconditional love, and I came to believe that first day I walked in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and I came to believe in the love from you guys. And, um, you know, I, I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, obviously, you know, my mom was in AA, right, because she died, and here I am, you know, and um, I've had a hard four days. <laughs> well, not today or yesterday, but before that, I'm still holding on to those days, you know. <laughs> but I'm raw, and I'm vulnerable, you know, and I... I uh, so here it goes. Uh, mom's first AA meeting was, this is my perception. How many people have heard my mom just out of curiosity? I never do this. Okay, good. That's interesting. Okay, good. So um, my mom got sober when I was 11 months old. This is my perception of my story, much different than mom's, but she, she came to AA at uh, 11 months, when I was 11 months old, and I grew up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? I ran around AA, I ran around the AA meetings, and I'd go to the conventions, and you guys would be in the meeting, and I'd be stealing all the light fixtures off the hallways and uh, stacking them in front of people's, you know, and security guard chasing after us, and we'd run back in the, in the meeting, and we'd just kind of hang out with you, and the old timers told me, we're saving the seat right here for you, kid, and I had no clue what that meant, you know what I mean? But they did, you know, there's my chair, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like I could recite chapter five, I could recite the 12 traditions. At the end of the meeting, I held hands, I'm like, keep coming back, you know, and, uh, oh my gosh, you know, and uh, AA was cool back then, you know, people would fall out of their chair and go into DTs and detox and seizures, you know what I mean? And me and my friends from AA be like, oh my God, look at that guy. Good people from AA would cart him right out of there, you know, and the speaker wouldn't even skip a beat, man, he'd just keep going, and, uh, my mom brought women home uh, from the AA meeting. We After the AA meeting, they'd get the newcomer, and we'd all go to Denny's, and I'd sit in the middle. They'd put the newcomer in the middle of the booth and the person with the most time around them, and they just hostage them, you know? 
and I'd pass out, and at 2.30 in the morning, we'd wake up, they'd send the newcomer home, and, we'd, and I'd go home, you know. And I have this picture I found of my mom, and my mom's on, on this podium, and she's like this, and it says, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm passed out on the podium. If knowledge had anything to do with this disease, I'd never taken my first drink. My mom brought a woman home, and she died, on, she died in our home. I knew what alcoholism and drug addiction did. I knew what recovery did. I'd come here, watch the broken in my home. At a year sober, she'd be like, I got a whole new set of teeth. <laughs> and everybody would be like, yeah. And I'd be like, yeah. You know what I mean? Man, I, I was like, dang, AA works. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, as a little kid, you know. If love hanging this dude do this disease, I'm taking my first drink. I could feel the love in this room tonight. You guys, today, this morning, you know what I mean? You guys are giving, making me come to believe today. I come in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous. I look into your eyes, and I see God right in you. But I go upstairs in my room some days and look in the mirror and can't see God. I need you guys more today than I did when I got sober on October 23rd, 2002. And, uh, but I was raised with a lot of love. But my perception of life's a little. You know what I mean? Because mom's a blackout drinker, which means I'll never know who my dad is. <laughs> I mean, for all I know, my dad could be the cable guy. It's like, found you now, you know. <laughs> Pool boy's here, you know, and, uh, you know what I mean? You know, mom also got pregnant in a blackout, right? <laughs> she gave birth in a blackout. She thought she was constipated, so she called 911. <laughs> so I guess that's what you do when you're constipated, you call 911. <laughs> she gave birth, and the paramedic's like, you need to name him. She's like, name what? <laughs> Her name's Patty, so she named me Patrick, so she wouldn't forget my name. My mom used to send me a text it's, every time I spoke that said, make sure you tell him the truth. My son sent it to me this morning. I have friends that have sent it to me this morning. And I'm grateful for that. But I miss that text from my mom. So the truth is, I'm supposed to be a turd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mom. <laughs> but my perception of my life is that I, that I have no love in my life. My perception of my life is that I stood at the window and stare, stared outside my apartment bedroom window and, and watched the cars drive down the street and wonder if that was my dad. And I had this loneliness on the inside. We talk about this spiritual malady, right? Coming to believe. I shut off from God as a little child. As a little kid, I sat there and looked out the window and wondered if my dad was coming home and said, there is no God. I peed the bed till I was 10 years old. I've bitten my nails since I was in. I've always had this high anxiety. Always with that sense of, I wonder if dad's coming home. And I didn't know any of the story I told you. That's in retrospect. But I sat there and wondered if my dad was ever coming, you know. And uh, the spiritual malady for me is real simple. I'm a right fielder on the baseball team. Any right fielders here? Oh, a couple of you done enough work to own it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that hasn't done the work going, I ain't admitting to that, you know, because it's the loser position, you know, we all know, you know what I mean, I throw the ball as hard as I can that way, it goes like two feet that way, you know, <laughs> you know I'm the kid in the neighborhood sports, everyone gets picked, there's two of us left, and the captain goes, well, I guess I'll take Pat, you know, <laughs> You know, one of the best ways to describe myself is I'm a little kid in elementary school that smells like poopy pants and syrup. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm weird. I'm awkward. My hair's like, you know what I mean? I'm just awkward. You know what I'm saying? I'm a right fielder. I probably would have been diagnosed with ADD. I was in left field looking for the long grass thing with the white thing. Somebody told me if I blew off all those things, I can have a wish, and I'm wishing for a different life out in left field. You know what I mean? self pities my mode of operation. My coach is yelling at me, the other side of the field. Oh, okay, right fielder, off back off to left, you know, left field to right field. One time I was on second base, I don't even know how I got there. I was absolutely terrified. I was consumed with self. Where do I go? What do I do? What happens? Oh, my God, how did I get here? Kid cracked a line drive, and I ran back to first base. <laughs> it's like a triple play in the wrong direction. <laughs> Little poopy pants at the dugout. You know, 
All my friends are running out of the dugout. What I heard him say that day is you're a failure, you're a loser, and you're no good. No idea where those thoughts came from, but that was the voice in my head as a little kid long before I ever took my first drink. I remember looking at my mom in the stand. She's clapping, so proud of her kid. Not proud because I had a triple play, proud because it took me an hour to get out of that stupid car to go to that stupid field to play that stupid game one more time. And she was proud I had enough courage to get out of that car. But I remember looking at my mom that day saying, if I only had a dad, that had never happened. I shut off from God a long time before, before I even knew what God was. My mom would take me to, my grandma would take me to church and, and she'd be doing the deal, you know what I mean? She'd be flop, <laughs> doing the deal, you know what I mean? And I'm sitting there listening to the same message, listening to the same music, wondering why I ain't doing that, why I ain't connecting like grandma was. What's wrong with me? I'll tell you what happened. At nine years old, I took my first drink of alcohol. My life changed. You talk so greatly about the spirit, you know what I mean? Like when you said that, I was like, bingo, you know. I was at an AA meeting when I took my first drink, you know, and uh, I was nine and your kid was 14 and your kid was 14 and you all brought him to AA and that's what we did. We ran around AA. I mean, I smoked weed and Alateen, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, we every, all the AAs think, well, we'll send our kids to Alateen. We're like, you know, and, uh, but at nine years old, I, I was at an AA meeting in Laguna Beach a Saturday night at the hospital, still going on today. You know what I mean? It'll go on tonight at eight o'clock and there was this guy who was a chronic relapser. And I know that now, but I didn't know that at the time, but he used to smoke cigarettes and he'd wear a trench coat on, he had an eye patch and he was pissed off, Ugh, you know, F those people in AA, I hate them, you know what I mean? And he was just grumble, grumble, grumble. And he'd find the oldest old timer and he'd get some nails and he'd put it, put it under your tire and he'd go, I want to see how serene they are now, you know? And the old timer would leave and the tire would pop and he'd sit there and just go, because you would get out of the car and just fix the tire and go on, you know? And he was baffled. We used to throw little pebbles at him, and so I threw a pebble at him. He chased after me. I ran through the hospital, ran out the front door. I was following my friends, ran up the parking structure. I remember like it was yesterday. We we're between the third and the fourth story, and they ball, pulled out a bottle of Jose Cuervo. And I didn't know what alcohol was going to do to me or for me that day, but I knew deep down within that if I didn't drink that stuff, those kids weren't going to like me. The bottle got to me, and I was scared. Took a pull off that thing. I hated the taste. It burned. It was disgusting. I spit it out, and I was overcome with fear. And that fear told me that I was never going to be like the rest of my life. Bottle went back around. I remember the second time getting that bottle. I remember putting that stuff down. And I remember talking to myself, hold it down, hold it down, hold it down. I held that tequila down. What happened for me? For the first time in my life, I connected to you. For the first time in my life, I felt a part of you. For the first time in my life, I felt like I could communicate all of a sudden, what happened in little poopy pants at nine years old is I started drinking in the time when gangster rap was coming in. I grew up in Mission Viejo, California, but I wore a size 50 dickies pulled all the way up. And <laughs> I had a 5XL sweatshirt, and I walked with a limp. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I drank St. Ives out of a brown paper bag because that's what Ice Cube was drinking. And uh, I poured beer in the curve for the dead homies. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I live in Mission Viejo. And, uh, <laughs> I don't have any dead homies, but I'm getting ready for some, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that's what alcohol does for poopy pants is he gives it power. Alcohol gives me power. I don't need God. I got power right here, liquid power. I don't need God. I found God right in the bottle. And all of a sudden, I was going to go on a road that I didn't know. I didn't know I was gonna about to go on. I was going to start to do things I didn't know I was going to do. My moral compass was telling me everything opposite, but alcohol was going to tell me exactly what alcohol was going to tell me to do. And uh, you know, I mean, I got root canal and LSD. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that. But, uh, it was nine in the morning. I was one forty ounce deep going to get a root canal, you know, because I drink every day. I don't think like you're going to root canal. You probably shouldn't drink. I just drink every day. I'm 140 ounce deep on the bus going to get a root canal with my friend, and I reach my hand in my pocket, and God, God delivered for its LSD. I said, hey, man, you want to eat these? He said, absolutely. So we both took two hits of acid about an hour before I was sitting in the dentist chair. And uh, you know what happens an hour in. <laughs> the tools are like, Whoa. He put the mask on. It was like, bow, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I'm going to chase the bow, wow, wows for a long time. You know what I mean? I remember coming to, like, asking the dentist, can we do this again tomorrow? You know? <laughs> But, like, that's how it is. More is better. Like, I don't think of, like, the consequences. I don't think, like, you probably shouldn't do this. You know what I mean? I'm like, right, next, boom, boom. Yeah, I'm a trash can. I don't know I'm going to AA. 
I didn't know I was going to face the purist around here. <laughs> Mom found a bag of weed in my house at her in her house at 16. Mom's like, you can't smoke weed in, in my house. I don't know how you hear that, but I hear I need to hide it better. <laughs> <laughs> So I hide it better, and I black out. I pee all over my mom's fish tank coming out of a blackout. My mom goes to Idaho. I steal her truck for the weekend. You know, she goes and speaks in Kansas. I have a party in her house. I'm an absolute wreck. I'm hiding it better. I'm hiding it better. One more time, I come home in a blackout. I ring the doorbell. Mom's standing there with a bag of weed in her hand. And I'm coming out of a blackout. I think I'm a little in trouble. And mom said to me that day, she said, you're out of here. Since coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned that I have a hearing problem. Because what mom said that day, she said, you can stay here and be sober or go out there on the streets and get loaded, but you need to make a choice. Here I am thinking I'm making a choice over alcohol, but alcohol is going to make this choice for me because it told me you're kicked out. And I walked in my bedroom at 17, I packed my backpack and I walked by my mom and I looked her right in the eyes. I said, I said, I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your life. And I'm going to make you pay for this decision. And I watched my mom's heart break. I don't know how you deal with shame and guilt, but anger is a good solution for shame and guilt. I grabbed my mom and I slammed her up against the wall. F you, I hate you, you're never going to see me again. I left that day. At 17, I went to an abandoned house where I was getting loaded, took my first hit of crack cocaine, and it was on. And my life changed. One more time, I pushed that goalpost. I drew another line in the sand. I'm never going to do. And I'd, be, and I'd be on the streets from 17 till I got sober at 27. I've already identified my alcoholism as an alcoholic. Once I put alcohol in this body at nine years old, it altered and changed my way of life. I was faced with the decision that in order to live at home, you can't drink. And yet alcohol tells me I have to drink. Disease of alcoholism is progressive. I'm not going to get into it. But what happened for me at 27 years old? I stood in the corner of 6 in Los Angeles. I've been living on Skid Row for a year and a half. I was 98 pounds. I had two shoes, only one had a sole. I hadn't showered in six months. I stood in the corner of six in Los Angeles, thought I was an antenna, thought I was communicating with the aliens. <laughs> I was like, blah, 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 and I was like channeling information from normal people. And you talked about it last night, our alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Every Sunday I go downtown, I go down Skid Row. I talk to folks that are just like me. I am no different then. I need to go down there pretty often to remind me that if I take one drink of alcohol, I'll end up back there just like that. And I also know that this podium will kill a man like me. Because this podium does the same thing alcohol does for me as it gives me power. And I've used that power in a lot of ways to hurt a lot of people unconsciously, which I'll get into. But I stood there that day on 6th in Los Angeles as a straight man. My last hustle, I'd walk into West Hollywood Bar and I'd flirt with enough gay men to get enough alcohol in my body and hope that I'd make it out before I black out. So grateful that what I've learned around here is that if you're laughing, you're identifying. <laughs> because my last hustle... I would come to in bed with a dude I had no clue who he was but knew what I did the night before in order to get what I need to get. And I would come to with that shame and that guilt and that remorse and that fear and that loneliness. And every morning I'd have that first thought that would say, go to that liquor store and get that bottle of tequila and all that, everything will be all right. And I'd go to that liquor store and I'd get that tequila and I'd put that stuff back. Two shots of tequila and all that shame and all that guilt and all that remorse would go away and stuff back down the road doing the same thing I always do. Coming to, making that promise, I'm never going to do it again. Making that solemn oath, I'm never going to do that again. Back doing it again, day in and day out. I was in and out of jail. I, I mean, I'm not like a cr criminal. I just 
possession charges, in and out of jail. I'm not a show up kind of guy. And I was looking at three and a half years in prison. I stood there that day and I was trying to get in the Salvation Army. And uh, when you take alcohol in my body, you get real angry. I was going to get in the next morning. I took a drink. And I came to that next morning. and One more time, same situation in bed with a dude I had no clue who it was, but I knew what I did the night before. Same feelings of shame, guilt, remorse, and fear. Nothing different except one thing. I had a spiritual defense that walked right in between me and that first drink. And that spiritual defense said, why don't you call your mom and ask for help? I picked up the phone. I called my mom. I said, Mom, I need help. My mom said, I can't help you anymore. She said, just stay right where you are, and someone from Alcoholics Anonymous will come and get you. She said, if I come and get you, I'm going to end up killing you. And she hung up on me. I'm so grateful she didn't come. I would have manipulated her for 20 more bucks, and I can guarantee you I wouldn't be standing here this morning. These two goofy guys from AA came. AA was not attractive that day, I can tell you that. <laughs> this guy had big hair. My mom called every high-profile old-timer first to help her kid, you know what I mean? Because she wants the best guy to help her kid, and none of them answered, you know? But the guy that answered was on fire for AA, you know what I mean? Like a year's sobriety. He's like, where's the kid at? I'll go get him right now, you know? And, uh, <laughs> And he grabbed another new guy, and they showed up, and the new guy was on a walker. He told him, if you don't go with me, you're going to die. You know what I mean? I'll go. You know what I mean? And they show up to the motel, and, and uh, they walked in, and I was sitting there violently shaking. You know what I mean? 98 pounds. He came, and he's like, my name's Jack. I'm an alcoholic. You know, the other guy was on a walker. He's like, my name's John. I got 90 days sober. You know what I mean? <laughs> and here goes that thinker, that separator. I'm not like you. The grace of God entered my life that day. Because Jack said, come with me, kid. And I got off that bed and I followed that guy in that motel room. I've ne never trusted men my whole life. I didn't trust that guy either. But God pushed me right out that motel room. And I got downstairs at the van. He said, hey, kid, if you need to throw up, just throw up on the floor. He's like, yeah, it's a 12-step van. Don't worry about it, you know. And, uh, <laughs> He said, you might have a 12-step van one day, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I want, dude. I want people throwing up in my car, great, you know. And I got in the back, and Jack told me a story. So I've gone to AA before. I identify as an addict. Don't do that in AA. Maybe here in LA, but I'd go to AA, identify as an addict, and then, get the addict out of my room. <laughs> He's going to infest AA, you know. And I leave AA, and no one ever followed me out of the room and gave me a big book and said, you might suffer from untreated alcoholism. Maybe you're dying. Don't even know what alcoholism is. I go out there, and I die. I come back to AA, and I don't identify because I don't want the judgment. I go out there, and I die. And I come back to AA, identify as an alcoholic and an addict, and some guy would go, ha, ha, put $2 in the basket, kid. Ha, 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 ha. Look at the stupid newcomer in the back who doesn't know how to identify around here. I go out there, and I die. But no one ever said, hey, kid, you want to come with me to Denny's and sit down? Let me tell you my story. One alcoholic talking with another. I'm so grateful for the responsibility statement that says when anyone anywhere reaches out for help, we want the hand of AA to be there. And for that, I'm responsible. There's no judgment in that responsibility statement. It's my responsibility to take the new man from the blank book, page to page 164 in the book, and identify my alcoholism. And if he's, if he's an alcoholic, then we have a solution for him here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if he's not an alcoholic, it's still my responsibility to take that man's hand and put it in the hand of a member of another fellowship in order for him to recover. But that guy that day told me his story. And he said, oh, this one time I drank and I went to the hospital. John goes, ha, ha, ha. This other time I drank and I went to the hospital. And John goes, ha, ha, ha. This other time I drank and I went to the hospital and John goes, ha, ha, ha. And Jack goes, hey, what happens to you when you drink? He goes, well, I, I, I drink and I go to the hospital. And Jack goes, ha, ha, ha. No, this other time I drank and I went to the hospital and Jack goes, ha, ha, ha. And they told me all their stories about drinking and they were laughing and they were identifying. And we ended up at Charlie Street. I sat down on the couch and Jack goes, hey, Bill, come on over, meet new guy, Pat. 
hey, what happens to you when you drink, Bill? Bill goes, well, I drink and I go to the hospital. And they both go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> oh, I drink and I go to the hospital. And they ha, ha, ha. And they start telling their stories and telling their stories. Every time they drink, they go to the hospital. And I start looking at the differences because I don't go to the hospital. And Jack caught me thinking. He goes, well, what happens to you when you drink, Pat? I go, well, I don't go to the hospital. He goes, well, where do you go? I go, I go to jail. <laughs> he said, oh, hey, Pete, come on over. Meet new guy, Pat. He said, hey, Pete, when you drink, what happens to you? He goes, oh, man, this one time I drank and I, went to, and I went to jail and I went, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and what happened from you guys telling me when you drink, what happens? I started to identify with you. I started to identify with your alcoholism. And then Jack turned the conversation. He talked about what happens in between drinks. I never wanted to prostitute myself one more time for one more hit. I wanted to know what the heck. I was baffled. And he said, Pat, every time you go to jail, what happens? I go, well, H&I comes. I'm like going to be sober. I go to church. I'm going to do the deal. But about an hour before I get out of jail, I start thinking. He said, really? What are you thinking about? Well, the conversation goes like this. Pat, you're not an alcoholic. If you just get off heroin, everything will be all right. And I get out of jail. I get a 12-pack of beer, one beer down. Phenomenon craving, shame, guilt, remorse go away, goes away. In the middle of the second beer, I wonder what they're doing down the street. I'm down the street meeting a new friend. All of a sudden, we're business partners. Before you know it, I'm back in jail. <laughs> He said, what happened that time? I said, well, H&I, church, doing the deal, making a solemn oath. I'm not going to drink. An hour before I get out, I have a conversation with myself. He said, what did the conversation say that time? Crack cocaine's your problem. Just don't do crack. You're not an alcoholic. Get a 12-pack of beer, one, same deal, back down the street, doing the same deal, time in and time in and time. He said, Pat, if you can conceive both propositions, physical and mental, he said, you might be alcoholic. Might be. And I started to cry, fell down on the ground. I said, Jack, I said, I'm alcoholic. He said, oh, great. This is great. This is going to be great. You know. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be your sponsor, kid. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to give you two directions. I want to read the big book. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to take a shower. And I thought, how did he know? <laughs> <laughs> I went to the room. I read the big book. It was like the Charlie Brown show. I have a ninth grade education, ticket tape, stockbroker. Is that a dude at Albertson stock on the shelf? Is that a dash 52 or a negative? I don't know what that means. I don't know any of this stuff. I'm not a stockbroker. I never was in war. Totally different. But I took my first right action. I went to the shower. I turned the water on. I fell down the ground. I started to cry. Jack came in that day. He got on the floor of the dirty detox. He put his hand on me. He said, it's going to be all right, kid. I didn't know I was coming to believe in that moment. But Jack rubbed my arm. And I just cried in his, I cried in his lap and he rubbed my arm and he said, it's going to be all right, kid. And somewhere in there, God stepped in in that moment and I turned and I looked at him in the eyes. And he said, I love you, kid. He didn't care where I had been, who I had done it with, where I was going, where I had none of that. All he cared about was that I didn't take a drink that day. And he was going to do whatever he had to do in his own power, to put my hand in the hand of God so that I could have that internal power. And in that moment, I trusted him. He said, I want you to stand up. I stood up. He said, I want you to take off your shirt. I took off my shirt. He held onto my arm. I was shaking violently. He said, I want you to take one step in the shower. I took one step in. I took another step in. I was all the way underneath the water, shaking violently. That man took a washcloth, he took a bar of soap, and the man scrubbed my back. For the first time in my life, I felt love from another human being. 27 years old, sitting there that day for the first time, feeling love from another human being. I didn't come to believe in God. Jack said, do you believe in God? I said, absolutely not. I'm never going to believe in God. Does not, God does not exist. But what I came to believe in that moment was I came to believe in the love in you. He said, Pat, you got to make a decision. A decision for what? He said, a decision to turn your will and life over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous. He caught it. I didn't, he didn't say, if he had told me God, I'd have fought him. No, he caught it. He said, you need to come to make a decision that AA is going to give you a good life. There was no denying that you guys had a good life and I was dying. 
I made a decision to do what that guy told me to do. Day one, I was writing an inventory in Charlie Street. 90 days, I was making amends to my mom. Let me back up. At four days sober, he said, you got to go to turn yourself in. He said, everything's going to be all right. I said, dude, Jack, the, the judge told me if I go see the, him again, he's going to sentence me to three years in prison. Oh, no, no, you're sober. Hey, hey you're going to live a good life. It's all good. You're going to go. <laughs> Remember, you made a decision to do what we told you to do. He came and picked me up, put me in the suit. <laughs> I seem to have lost a lot of weight, kind of like the suit I'm wearing now. But um, it was like, you know. I show up to see the judge, and we rolled in his Porsche, ball in, you know, and, uh, and we're sitting at court, and, and the judge comes, he looks at me, and it's about lunchtime, and he says, Mr. Ochoa, I said, yes, sir, stand there, yes, sir, he said, I told you last time you were in my courtroom, I was going to sentence you to three and a half years in prison, he said, I wasn't lying, Boulder, guard came and cuffed me up, took me down to the holding tank to go to prison for three years, and I started having a conversation with myself. How'd you trust that man? You never trusted men your whole life. Here you finally trust this guy, and one more time another man's failed you, just like your dad. I got on my knees, and I prayed to a God I didn't believe in. Because the old timers taught me, that he told me, he said, we don't care if you believe or don't believe, just get on your knees and pray anyways. For 10 years, my prayer went like this. God, I don't believe that you exist. But the people in Alcoholics Anonymous told me that I need to pray anyways. I was getting shackled to go to jail, prison, and I heard my last name called. Guards, I don't know why I'm doing this, but judge wants to see you. I walk to see the judge. Judge looks at me and goes, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to give you another chance. member of Alcoholics Anonymous who's been sitting here all day fighting for you to get out. There's a bed available for you at the Salvation Army. I walked in the Salvation Army. I met a guy by the name of Tim. I used to get loaded with Tim. Tim had gotten sober. He became a drug and alcohol counselor. He was the one that answered the phone when Jack called. I still didn't believe. Made amends to my mom. My mom said, I just want you to get in the middle of AA and help people. Jack said, what about the money? I said, she didn't want the money. He said, but AA wants you to pay it back. (laughs) I had to write a note, Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today. Leave her 25 bucks. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today. Leave her 25 bucks. And I made, did this every week, every week, every week. Then Jack said, you got to do it every day. So I did it every day. Five years sober, my mom took me to, di- to dinner for my birthday. She said, I no longer want the money anymore, but I still want the notes. Wrote the notes. I called my mom. I wanted to call her yesterday. Called her every day until the day she died. I got fire for AA. Caught fire for this deal. Sponsoring guys, service committees, doing doing the deal, doing the work. and Kid. And eight and a half years sober, I was dying of untreated alcohol. I cheated on my son's mom. I cheated on another girlfriend I was with. I didn't want to do that behavior. I'd go home and want to put a bullet in my mouth every night. I hated myself. Eight and a half years so- sober, I'm going to kill myself one more time. Driving down the road, I made a commitment when my car gets 100 miles an hour, I'm barreling my car in oncoming traffic. It was 98, and I heard a voice in my back seat that said, call that guy Jonathan from your Tuesday night meeting before you kill yourself. I picked up the phone. It was midnight. I called him. He said, I've been ans- waiting for this call for a year. He said, I want you to meet me at Denny's. I said, I'll, me- I'll meet you there, dude. I'm- I'll-, I'll-, I'll meet you there. He said, no, I'm going to stay on the phone until you get there. He knew I wasn't going to show up. I walked into Denny's. He opened the big book to page 52 that he talked about last night. Couldn't control my emotional nature. prey to misery and depression, relationships, blah, 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 all that stuff. And he said, what you're suffering from is untreated alcoholism. If I was right where I was supposed to be, I was sponsoring a ton of guys, speaking, being a service, doing what we're supposed to do when I'm taught in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the truth was, was that I didn't believe in God. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the prejudices that you have towards God. He said, I don't want you to give up the prejudices. All I want you to do is I want you to set them aside. He said, I want you to take those capitalized words and I want you to ask, set those those aside and I want you to write what God is for you. 
And I wrote this list down. Had to look at what a vision of sanity was for me. That was hard. But I was still locked up. He said, what's blocking you from having a relationship with God? I said, what people in AA think of me? All the other stuff I could go on, but that was the real hook. You know, when I got sober, I said, how am I going to fill my mom's shoes? My sponsor said, all you have to do is fill your own. Thank you, Mom, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, Ralph, for being the, the con to that. And I had to say a prayer, God, please take me to a place where none of these things are as important as a relationship with you. And these things started being taken away, one by one. And we agnostics, it says in the last analysis, when I am absolutely broken, the last analysis, there is no more like, is it this, is it that? When I am, talked about surrender, and I was absolutely 100% leveled. Was I then able to make a decision, which Carl will talk about. But I was suicidal in the rooms for a year and a half. From eight and a half years sober to ten years sober, I was suicidal. And I don't just mean like, hey, I think I'm going to kill myself. I would leave the meeting. I, would, I wouldn't sleep for seven days. I was 130 pounds. I was, I was uh, you know, sponsoring guys. I was doing the deal, but I want to kill myself. And I'd call my sponsor on the end of the bridge saying, I'm going to jump. I'm going to kill myself. And he would say, Patty said, I love you so much. He said, will you meet me at the meeting before you kill yourself? Because I'd like to say goodbye to you. <laughs> One more time, character defect and wanting you to like me. I waited a whole 24 hours just to show up at the meeting so my sponsor could say goodbye to me. <laughs> but what would happen to me was I felt a little bit better. I'd go to the meeting to say goodbye and I would leave and I'm going to kill myself on the, uh, you know, and this went on for a year and a half. But every day he would say, how's it amends to your dad coming along? I'm not making it. How's it amends to your mom coming along? I ain't making it. Okay, I'll see you at the meeting tomorrow. Day in, day out. And I'd kill myself, kill myself, not sleep. And one time I got smart enough. It, was, it took me a year and a half. About. I said, man, if I call him, he's going to tell me to go to the AA meeting. I'm not doing it. So I pull off the 57 bridge. Now I'm praying every day. I'm trying to find that. I want God's relationship so bad. I'm praying, I'm praying. Why well, do I want to kill myself? Why am I like this? What's wrong with me? Why is everyone else in here having a good life? And I'm over here dying in the rooms. I don't get it. I'm not willing to make amends to my dad, and I'm not willing to make amends to God, and I'm wondering why I don't have a relationship. So I pull my car off the 57 bridge. I'm done. I'm going to jump. And I pull my car over, and I said, God, you have 10 seconds. I'm done. I prayed. I'm meditating. I'm uh, woo, woo, woo. I got the crystals out. I got the incense burning. I'm doing the deal. Like, I'm trying to seek. I'm trying to find something outside of me, outside of me, outside of me to fix an inside job. I said, you have 10 seconds. I'm done. You're not showing up in my life. F you. I hate you. Got out of the car. I walked to the, to, the, to the front driver's side, got to the headlight, and my phone rang. It was from an unknown number. And I don't answer unknown numbers. Probably a creditor. But I answered that day. I said, hello? This kid on the other end of the line said, hey, Pat, I met you at a meeting three days ago. My name's Chris. He said, I'm going to drink. I said, oh, no, no, Chris, we don't drink one day at a time here at Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> So we don't drink one day at a time. And I started to talk about my thinking that precedes a first drink. I said, every time in between drinks, I have this thinker that thinks about how I can control and enjoy it and how I can. I looked at my phone. It was 7 o'clock. I said, Chris, there's an AA meeting starting at 730. You want to meet me there? He said, absolutely. I said, all right, Chris, I'll meet you there. And I got in my car. I drove 30 miles to Laguna Beach. I walked in the Canyon Club, and there was Chris. And Chris said, oh, my God, you saved my life. I was going to drink. He said, we'd be my sponsor. I said, absolutely. 
I said I was about, I didn't say this to him, but I'm thinking to myself, I was just about to kill myself 30 minutes ago. Absolutely. I'd love to be your sponsor. You know what I mean? He didn't need to know he was dealing with a whack job. I went home that night. I was on the couch screaming and crying like I did every night. F you, God, I hate you. And I felt a hand push me off the couch, threw me on the floor. I was in the fetal position at three in the morning, screaming, crying, F you, God, I hate you. And I started to make amends to a man I never met. I used that man in every relationship. I'd be in a relationship with a girlfriend. If I only had a father to teach me how to be a man to you, I'd know how to be a man. Every relationship with a man, if I only had a father to teach me how to be a friend, I'd know how to be a friend to you. If I only had a father in my life to teach me how to go to work, I'd know how to be a man amongst men. And I used that man in every relationship in my life to keep you at arm's distance. And it allowed me to be a victim in my own life. And what happened for me in that moment when I made that amends, that victim was torn right out of me and this power of God went deep down within. The power of love that I created in two when I looked at the separated those prejudices and that, that love that's deep down, that love and that light that's within me came right out. And the power of God has used me time in and time out and day in and day out to be with you. I have to talk about my mom. I've been avoiding this, obviously, you know. And uh, My mom, um, you know, died January 10th. Uh, I was speaking in Medford. I was telling, I guess I'm going, that's the story. I'm telling, I was speaking in Medford. I, 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 about the time making making amends to my dad, I was I made, made, made amends to my aunts, and they're like, your dad is this guy. And I'm like, no, no, my mom got pregnant, blackout. They're like, no, no, it's this guy. We know for sure. So then I get resentful at my mom. She didn't tell me about this guy. You know what I mean? I'm like, ah, ah, you know, and I go to my sponsor. He's like, well, just pray about it. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they ain't giving me no answers. You know what I mean, tell me what I need to do. I'm going to rip this woman's head off, you know. And, and so I'm in Medford, Oregon speaking, and Larry Thomas is there. And I, and I say, Larry, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I'm going crazy. We talk to me. He said, I'd love to talk to you. We go to coffee. I woe is me for 30 minutes. And he just basically says, it sounds like it's all about you. He said, don't you think that if your mom was ready to have a conversation with you, she'd have it? I said, yeah, I think so. I left. Everything was good. No big deal. A year ago, my mom died January 10th. A year ago, Christmas, she gives me ancestry DNA. I'm like, this is my mom's way of walking the path with me. I do the ancestry DNA. The results come back. I'm scared to get them. Because the truth is, is when I know the truth, right, this story no longer exists. So I'm scared. I don't look at the results. You know what I mean, and, uh, and so I finally look at the results, and I don't find my dad. My expectation's not met. I'm mad at this, but I found a first cousin. But I don't even know what a first cousin is. But I'm mad because I don't find my dad, so I put it aside. About eight weeks before my mom died, she went on hospice five weeks, but eight weeks before, all of a sudden, I get a call from the, um, uh, from the first cousin. And uh, first cousin, you know, and I go, well, my mom got pregnant, a blackout. I'll never know who my dad is. That's the story. And, and uh, so I go tell my mom, and my mom, I go, she goes, what's the last name? I go, the last name Sandoval. My mom goes, oh, this fast. She goes, oh, your, your dad's name is uh, Sandy Sandoval. She goes, yeah, he was the owner of the bar I drank at. Two days later, I go to her house. She gives me a picture of my dad holding me as an infant underneath the keg tap. <laughs> she says this is your dad mom's there you know mom we go to the home group my mom was an active member my mom passed the basket around she goes to five meetings a week active member of AA sponsors a lot of women go to the home group Wednesday night after the home group she goes to the hospital they can't put the scope down rush her down to scripts they got to do emergency surgery. There's a tumor in her blocking her airway. They core out the tumor. They put her on hospice. My mom goes, I want, she was supposed to go home, and then I had left, and then she calls me and goes, Pat, they put me on hospice. But I'm, I'm only going on hospice to get off hospice, son. I believe my mom was going to make it. My mom had always made it. Two 
Two weeks later, home group goes home, can't breathe, rush her down to the hospital one more time. The tumor had grown back in two weeks. She had been diagnosed with lung cancer. And, uh, my first cousin, which is my niece, called me. I didn't know that at the time, but she called me and said, hey, I want you to know that uh, my mom took the ancestry DNA results and uh, you have six brothers and sisters. I went to go tell my mom, oh my God, mom, you won't believe it. I have six brothers and sisters. And my mom just kind of smirked and she shook her head. She's like, oh my God. <laughs> my mom's about to die. My mom's in and out of consciousness. And I have to go, I don't have to. I get the opportunity to go to Seattle. And I get the opportunity to go to Idaho to be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm having that spiritual battle in between, between head and heart. Because you guys share your experience that you were there when, you, when your mom died and you, how grateful you were for that last moment with your mom. And I wanted your experience so bad. I wanted to be there with my mom so bad when she took her last breath and that was in the head. My heart knew the right thing to do was for me to go be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm praying and I'm meditating and I'm not getting any answers and I'm praying and I'm meditating and I'm not getting any answers and all of a sudden I get the answer that says you need to go. I get on the plane, I go to Seattle, I go to the, get, off, get off the plane, I go see my mom for like an hour and I go back to sleep, get on the plane the next day to go to Idaho. I show up to Idaho, I do the deal, I come back and I, I walk in and my mom didn't know the battle I had going on in me. My mom was out of consciousness, she wasn't communicating. I walked in and my mom felt me walk in the door and she opened up her arms like this. And I went in, and I, I went into my mom, and she grabbed me, and she said, Pato, I want you to know you did the right thing. She just held me, and she said, Pato, I love you, 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 and that was a wow. Three days later, she died, and my heart broke. My niece called, uh, messaged me on Facebook two days ago, and she said, I want you to know that, that your brothers and sisters just lost their mom un unexpectedly. No coincidence that I find my family. I lose my mom unexpectedly, and they lose their parents unexpectedly. And I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous just to say yes, to go be of love and service to another alcoholic, to another human being. And I said, I'll be down there next week to come see you so that I can be of love and service to my new family. One more time, I come to believe day in and day out. I can't come to believe if I don't tap into the power in the morning. If I don't practice 10 and 11, I'm going to separate myself right from God, and I separate myself right from you, and I'm isolated and alone and back in untreated alcoholism. But when I, when I wake up in the morning like I did this morning, like I do every morning, I get tapped into that power. I allow God to use me, and I come to believe in every single moment in the eyes of you. Alcoholics Namas a lot more than just not drinking. Alcoholics Namas has been a process of growing up for me. And I'm grateful that I get the opportunity to grow up amongst good people like you. I'm grateful I get the opportunity to be on the podium with men and women that I've looked up to my whole sobriety. I got the call and I said, I'm underqualified. It's an honor, a privilege to be here with you, and I love you all. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.